Hey, I'm Mr. Bison. I've been a math teacher for the last 10 years, and I'm going to take you through today everything to do with trigonometry from year one and year two of A-level maths. Now, if you haven't visited my YouTube channel before, I have got hundreds of videos that are actually live recordings of my lessons. So they'll take you through everything you need to learn for every chapter of the A-level. I've also got some other videos, which I call the everything you need to memorize videos. These are a little bit longer, but they give you the full picture of all the stuff that you need to get into your head before you take those exams in the summer. These videos are going to be somewhere in between. So this trigonometry video is going to be a little bit about what you need to memorize and what you need to know as well as some problems in there that will be able to test out some of the things that I'm teaching you. If you like this video please do drop it a like and let me know in the comments which kinds of topics you would like me to be doing next. Just before we get started this video has been designed with edxl in mind but it's going to be applicable for all of the exam boards as this content on trigonometry really isn't going to change that much. So let's get started and see everything for trigonometry from year one and year two. Okay, so just before we get started, I'm gonna make this PDF of what I'm using here available in my Google Drive, which is gonna be linked in the description of the video. There'll be a blank version and a filled in version so that you can either print it off or use it yourself, or you can just see my answers that I've got here as well. So this one is gonna be what we're starting off with. We're gonna just do this first page, which is about trigonometry from year one. And we're gonna zoom in on this little section here that we've got about the different, different definitions that we have here. So you should probably know this from GCSE, but from this triangle that we've got here. The hypotenuse is the longest side. The one adjacent to the angle is obviously called the adjacent. And then the one opposite the angle is called the opposite. So we should know some different definitions. And these are that the sine of the angle is equal to the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. I'm sure you know that from GCSE. The cos of the angle is the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. And then last of all, the tan of the angle is the opposite divided by the adjacent. And these definitions are going to be so useful because they're just going to be used throughout this whole topic. So you really need to make sure you know all of these ones as well. And they just come from that triangle that you've got there. You're probably also familiar with this one from GCSE as well, but this is the cosine rule. Now the cosine rule is that a squared equals b squared plus c squared. And that bit there looks like Pythagoras, but there's a little extra bit, which is minus 2bc cos a. Now the thing that you want to be aware of for this one is that the only thing you're bothered about is that the a, so the length you're looking for, is going to be related to the cosine of the angle that's opposite it. So you can see in the diagram here a and a are the opposites. You've got the capital version for the uh, angle and the lowercase version for the side opposite. And that can be used to help you find some missing angles or missing um, a missing side. Depends on what the kind of context is and you'll see me doing an example with that later on. The sine rule is also something that's in GCSE, but there's this little extra bit about there being an ambiguous case. Now for the sine rule, again, you can check the way that I've labeled the triangle so that the angles are in capital letters and the opposite side are the lowercase versions of it. So for the sine rule, we say that the sine of A divided by its opposite side is the same as the sine of B divided by its opposite side which is the same as sine of c divided by its opposite side. And there's another version of this formula where all of them are flipped over. So instead of it's sine a over a, you've just got a over sine a, etc. And you don't actually use all three of these. You would probably use just a pair of them. So the sine rule is really good when you've got um, two sides and two angles. I've put down here the ambiguous case because maybe when you solve this equation, you'll end up with something like sine theta and you can find out what theta is equal to. The ambiguous case is that you can also do 180 minus the angle that you have so that um, there's two answers. And this is going to pop up in the example that we do later on. The area of a triangle you should know is a half AB sine C. This C that I've got here is a capital letter. And you'll notice from the diagram that to find the area of a triangle, you just need to know the size of the angle and the two sides that are either side of it. So you can see that in the lettering, the way it's been done here as well. So that's pretty familiar from GCSE. And we've also got these bits up here, which should be quite familiar from GCSE as well. So you do need to know the shapes of these graphs off by heart. Now you can see that I haven't labeled these different ones that I've got here, but hopefully we can spot that this first one that we have, this, um, this red one that we've got running along here, this red one is starting at zero. And so it's actually just going to be a sine X graph. The blue one, which starts at one, is a cos x graph, and the green one that we have is a tan x graph. So some of the features that you need to know about this is that the sine and cos graph only go between one and minus one. 
and you can see that they've got this pattern where sine starts at zero and it goes up, down, and then it goes up again, and cos starts at one and does that pattern. And it's kind of like a, a shift of it being 90 degrees backwards. Now the tan graph, it's not so clear to see it on this diagram, but the tan graph has got these vertical asymptotes at 90 degrees, and it has that vertical asymptote 180 degrees later at 270. Now I've just given you a screenshot of this one that we've got here. You can imagine that these graphs would just keep going forever and ever in the positive direction and also in the negative direction as well. So we're going to have a look at some exact values and these exact values, I'm actually going to do them from over here by having a look at some of the things on the graph. So the exact value of sine zero, well, you can see over here that sine zero is just equal to zero and also tan zero is also at the origin as well. When it's zero degrees though, cosine starts at one. At 90 degrees, you can see that sine has gone up to 1 on the graph and that cos has gone all the way down to 0. And at this point here, at 90 degrees, tan is undefined. Now, these things here you do need to know off by heart, so knowing the shapes of the graphs are really going to help you with that kind of stuff. People always wonder why they need to know these exact values, and the further you go through maths, the more you'll see that they have use. So if you're watching any of my long-form videos, you will see me often referring to these and asking the pupils in my class, what are the exact values? What are the exact values? How are you going to use them? So we'll start off by doing this sine 45, cos 45, and tan 45 section, and it all comes from a triangle that looks like this here. This is an isosceles uh, right angle triangle, so there's 45 degrees here and 45 at the top, and that means because one of the sides is 1, the other side is going to be 1. And so when you do Pythagoras, the hypotenuse will be equal to root 2. Now you've got this triangle, sine 45 is going to be equal to the opposite divided by the hypotenuse, which is 1 over root 2. And cos 45 is going to be the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse, which is also 1 over root 2. So both sine and cos of 45 are 1 over root 2. Now tan of 45 is the opposite divided by the adjacent, which is just equal to 1. Now we're going to come down to trying to figure out these extra ones that we've got down here of the 30s and the 60s. So what I've drawn is an equilateral triangle, and this equilateral triangle has got side length 2. Equilaterals have got 60 degrees here, because this angle has been split in 2, we've got a 30 degrees. So this little length along the bottom is just going to be 1, and then using Pythagoras, this line that we've got down here is going to be root 3. So I'm going to start off by thinking about the 30 degrees that we have for this one. The sine of 30 will be the opposite divided by the hypotenuse, which is just a half. Now, the cos of 30 can't be the same thing. The cos of 30 has got to be the root 3 over 2. So we've got the root 3 over 2 for that one. I'm going to come back to the tan of 30 in just a second. Now, once you've learned that sine of 30 is a half, it should be quite easy to make these predictions about these other ones that we have here. So if sine 30 is a half, well, sine 60 can't be a half. It's got to be the other one. It wouldn't make sense for it to be the same. So we're going to have it as root 3 over 2, which means that cos 60 has got to be the other one, which is a half. And you can verify that by having a look at the diagram. So for this last part, I've got tan 30 and tan 60. Well, I can look at the diagram and see that tan 30 is the opposite divided by the adjacent, which is 1 over root 3. And then to do tan 60, looking down here, I can do the opposite divided by the adjacent, which is just going to be root 3. Now, the reason I remember that it goes this way round is that 1 over root 3 is smaller than root 3, and 30 degrees is smaller than 60 degrees. So that's my way of remembering this. If you needed to remember only one of these things here, I would recommend... Oh, I would recommend memorising a half that you have, because once you know that's a half, that one has to be root 3 over 2, that one has to be root 3 over 2, and then the other one, which is switched from cos, sorry, from sine to cos and from 30 to 60, that one also has to be a half. So let's try an example problem that we've got here. This example problem is actually going to use all of the things that we've got on this page. So you might like to have a pause here and try this question yourself, um, but let's just go through this one together. So it says, given that angle ABC is a right angle and that theta is obtuse, find theta. So it looks like we've got a couple of different triangles stuck together here, and they're talking to us about something to do with this angle and this angle, because it says that ABC is a right angle. So I'm going to start off by trying to find out what this angle here is. I'm going to try and find out what that angle at that angle alpha is. Now I've got a side, a side, a side and an angle. This makes me think I'm going to need the cosine rule. So the cosine rule is that a squared equals b squared plus, two, uh, plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. So we're just going to be careful about all of the different things we've got here. The um, a squared in this case is the one that's opposite the angle. So it's going to be the 2 root 7. So it's going to be 2 root 7 all squared equals the other two sides. It doesn't matter which way around they go, which is 4 squared plus 6 squared minus 2 times 4 times 6 times the cosine of the angle, which is alpha. 
So 2 root 7 squared is going to be 4 times 7, which is 28. We've then got 16 plus 24 minus 48 cos alpha. So I've put the 48 cos alpha to this side. 16 plus 24 minus 28, that's 40 minus 28. Uh, 40 minus 28, which is... Have I done something wrong there? 30? Oh yeah, 6 squared is not 24, silly me. 6 squared is 36. So 16 plus 36 is 52, and 52 minus 28 is 24. So this means that cos alpha is 24 over 48, and 24 over 48 simplifies to a half. So we should know what alpha is off the top of our head, because we're saying what angle of cosine gives a half. And if we just look up here, the angle is going to be 60 degrees. So this means now that alpha is equal to 60 degrees. So I can go back to this diagram and I can add this in as a 60 degrees. Now remember, because angle ABC is a right angle, that must mean that this one here is 30 degrees. And we're going to try and find out what theta is equal to. So having a look at this triangle that we've got here, it looks like we have got a side and an opposite angle and a side and an opposite angle. So I think we can now use the sine rule for this one. So I'm going to say that the sine sine of 30 divided by the opposite side, which is 3 over root 2, must be equal to the sine of theta divided by its opposite side, which is 6. So let's just go about solving this. Sine of 30, you need to know, is um, a half. So it's a half divided by root 3 over 2 is equal to sine theta over 6. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 6. When I multiply by 6, I'm going to get a half times the 6, which is 3. So I get 3 over 3 root 2 is equal to sine theta. Those 3s cancel, so I get that sine theta is equal to 1 over root 2. Now, this is also one of our exact values. The one of the exact values we're going to have for this one is that sine of 45 is equal to 1 over root 2. So this means that theta is equal to 45 degrees. But remember, they've said something specific to us in the question, that theta is obtuse. So we're going to go back over here and remind ourselves of the ambiguous case, is that if you get the answer theta, you could also have the answer of 180 minus theta. So because it's obtuse, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 180 subtract 45. So another solution is 135 degrees, meaning that the size of theta for this is 135 degrees. Now we're going to move on to the second half of pure year one. Okay, so that was all pretty GCSE. Let's move on to some of the other stuff from year one. We're going to get some further definitions, which maybe you're still familiar with. So if you think about this triangle that we've got here, um, we can see that the hypotenuse is equal to one. If you were going to do some trigonometry using Sokotoa here, you would find out that the adjacent side is actually equal to cos theta. If you just think about why that's true, we know that cos theta is equal to the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse, which in this case is one. So cos theta is just equal to the adjacent. And we can do the same thing. We know that sine theta is equal to the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. So the opposite is just equal to sine theta. Now, this tells me some other things from here. I can also see that tan theta is equal to the opposite divided by the adjacent. The opposite is sine theta and the adjacent is cos theta. So we've now got a definition for tan theta in terms of sine theta and cos theta. Also, if you think about Pythagoras that we also know about from GCSE, we can think about looking at this triangle and actually just do Pythagoras to it. We know that Pythagoras is the two sides squared equaling the hypotenuse squared. So this tells us that sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is just going to be equal to one. So these two identities that you've got here and here are going to be incredibly useful. I also want to look, some, look at something that's not really made that much of a big deal of, and actually I think it's really useful to know, the cofunction identity. So this is where you add the co in. So you have sine and then you have cosine. So we'll try and see why this cosine and sine are related to each other. Just looking at this triangle and using our definitions of what sine and cos are, we can see that the sine of theta would be equal to the opposite, which is B, divided by the adjacent, which is A. And this is actually also going to be equal to the cosine of this other angle that we've got up here. So the cosine of 90 minus theta. Let's just check that makes sense. So the cosine of this angle is the adjacent of that angle divided by the hypotenuse, which is B divided by A. And similarly, we could also say that the cosine of theta, which is just going to be equal to its adjacent divided by the hypotenuse, which is C divided by A, is going to be equal to the sine of 90 minus theta. 
And you can again check that by using the triangle here, 90's opposite and 90 minus theta's opposite divided by its hypotenuse. So if you ever see something where it's like the cos of 90 minus theta, you can actually just replace that with the sine of theta. Okay, we're now going to get on to solving equations. Now, you're going to just take my word for these things that you've got here, but if you want to, I'm going to link a video that will explain why these identities that we have here are true. So to solve equations with trigonometry, first of all, you're going to find out what the calculator gives you for sine, and it's just going to give you theta. But there's going to be a second set of values that would be true for this, and the second set of values for sine theta are going to be 180 minus theta. Once you've got these two starting values, you can add or subtract 360 degrees to either of these two values and it will keep giving you more solutions. That's because the sine graph repeats every 360 degrees. Now for the cosine, you're going to get the first one that the calculator gives you, which is theta. And then to find the second one is you're just going to do 360 minus whatever the calculator gives you. And again, because the cosine graphs repeats every 360 degrees, for both of these two solutions, you can add and subtract 360 degrees as many times as you like for a particular given range. Now tan theta is a little bit easier. You just get the one that the calculator gives you, which is theta degrees, and because the tan graph repeats every 180 degrees, you can just add or subtract 180 degrees to that one. So let's just put that into a quick example that we've got here. I'm going to solve this one. So I've got that sine theta is equal to 0.6, and I want to give answers to the nearest degree. Well, I've already done on my calculator the inverse sine of 0.6 and got 37 degrees, but I also can find out what the other one is going to be. Now for sine, you do 180 minus that. So you do 180 minus 37, which is 143 degrees. I like to write it directly underneath. Now what you could do to find these other solutions, now that you've got these first starting two, is you can just add 360 to both of them. So if I add 360 to the top one, I would get 360, not 367, but 397 degrees. That's adding on 360. And if I add 360 to this one down here, I would get 503 degrees. Equally, I could keep adding 360 degrees, or I could have gone to this first value, I could have taken away 360 degrees, and any of those values would have been solutions. So that's what I mean about the starting point of getting the one from the calculator and then doing 180 minus. So let's just have a quick look at some equations that might have a linear input instead. So the equation we just had was just theta. This time we're going to look at an equation that might have something like 2x minus 20. It's a little bit um, mixed up. So what you need to do for this with a linear input, meaning this thing here, is you're going to change the range that is given to you in the question. Then you're going to solve it for the new range first and you try and find all of the solutions. And then you solve those for either x or theta or whatever the variable is that you have. So the, the range in this question, they're asking for the solutions of x between 0 and 90. But we're looking at 2x minus 20. So first of all, I'm going to double everything so that I get a 2x. And then I'm going to subtract 20 from everything so that I get my range is now 2x minus 20. So I'm now going to be looking for answers that are in the range between minus 20 and 160. So I'm going to find out what the bit inside the tan function is by doing the inverse tan of minus 0.4. So I'm going to just quickly do that on my calculator, the inverse tan of minus 0.4. I'm just going to do this to the nearest degree here. That is minus 22 degrees. But actually, that's not going to be inside the range because I want it to be in this range that we have. So for tan, you're also allowed to add 180 to that. So I'm going to add 180 and to the nearest degree, that is going to be 158 degrees. If I add another 180, it's going to go outside of this range that we have down here. So I'm not going to need to do it. I'm just going to simply draw a line through that. And now I'm going to solve the equation because I've found it for all of this range. I'm now going to solve it and find out what x is equal to. So I'm just going to add 20 to the one on my calculator. I'm going to divide it by 2. And to the nearest degree, that means that x is equal to 89 degrees. I would probably want to make sure that you write these down with a little bit more accuracy than the nearest degree, because when you divide by 2, that might slightly change some things that you've got there. So let's put all of year one trigonometry into practice by trying to solve this example problem that we have right here. You might like to pause the video and have a go yourself, um, and then we'll see how it goes. So it says for the example problem, show that 10 sine squared minus 7 sine 90, mi uh, 90 minus theta plus 2 over 3 plus 2 cos theta is always equal to 4 minus 5 cos theta. This identity means is always equal to. So I'm going to start off with the left hand side. And the left hand side that I've got here is the 10 sine squared theta minus 7 sine 90 minus theta plus 2. Well, first of all, I'm going to use the co function that we talked about over here. So I should be able to replace this or this with the other version of it. 
it. So I think we are going to replace that with the cos. So 10 sine squared theta minus 7 cos theta plus 2 all over 3 plus 2 cos theta. Now, I have got something that is a mixture of sine and cos, and you'll notice that we're trying to have something that's just in terms of cos here. So I'm going to try and deal with this sine squared theta that we have. Now, up here for this Pythagorean one that we've got, I probably should have said that we should know that cos squared theta is going to be equal to 1 minus sine squared theta by rearranging it. And similarly, sine squared theta is going to be equal to 1 minus cos squared theta. So I'm going to go back to this question, and I'm going to replace the sine squared theta with 1 minus cos squared theta. And I'm still going to have the minus 7 cos theta plus 2, and I'm going to divide all of that by the 3 plus 2 cos theta. So expanding the brackets on the top, I'm going to get 10 minus 10 cos squared theta minus 7 cos theta plus 2, all divided by 3 plus 2 cos theta. So we're getting on the right direction here. We're ending up with something that is just going to be in terms of cos theta. We just need to do a little bit more tidying up. So the numerator is going to become minus 10 cos squared theta, minus 7 cos theta, and that's going to be plus 12, and it's going to be divided by 3 plus 2 cos theta. Now, because we want to try and show, and technically I guess I should be saying these identity signs all the way along here, um, we want to try and show that this thing is going to be equal to 4 minus 5 cos theta. I'm just going to jot that down over here. I think that there's going to be something to do with factorising this and getting it to cancel here. So I think in the numerator, I think to factorise that top part, one of the things has got to be the 3 plus 2 cos theta. And I think actually the other thing is likely to be 4 minus 5 cos theta. Let's just check though and see if it works when we expand. You'd get the 3 times the 4, which is the 12, the 2 cos theta times the minus 5 cos theta, which is the minus 10 cos squared theta, and you'd get the 8 cos theta minus the 15, and 8 minus 15 is minus 7. So that does all work, and we still have it being divided by 3 plus 2 cos theta. These then cancel. And so we get that it's always equal to 4 minus 5 cos theta, which is exactly what the question wanted. Then the second part of the question says, hence solve for this range that we've got here, this equation being equal to 6 cos squared 2x. So one of the things that I'm going to do to start off with, let's just move some of this across here so I've got a little bit more space. I am going to say that the range is changing. So instead of it being between minus 180 and 180, I'm going to double the range so that it's going to be in terms of 2x. And so it's going to be from minus 360 to 360 degrees. OK, and so here you'll notice this pretty much looks exactly the same as this, apart from everywhere that it says theta, it says 2x. So what this means that I can do for part B of the question is I can replace this whole thing with this, but instead of a theta, it will be a 2x. So I'm going to get 4 minus 5 cos 2x equals 6 cos squared 2x. Now I'm going to put this all on one side that it looks like a quadratic. So I'm going to have 0 is equal to 6 cos squared 2x plus 5 cos 2x minus 4. Now this is actually just a type of quadratic that you've got here. You can either try and spot how it's just going to factorise, or you can just go to your calculator and put it into the quadratic solver. So for the quadratic solver that you've got here, it's a polynomial with degree order 2, and the coefficients are 6, 5, and minus 4. This gives me that either cos 2x is equal to a half, or this gives me that cos 2x is equal to minus 4 over 3. But if you remember from earlier on, the cos graph can only go between 1 and minus 1. So this one here is not going to be a solution. This one's going to have no solutions because minus 4 over 3 is smaller than minus 1. So all that comes to do now is just solving this last part of the equation that we have here. So I'm going to do inverse cos of a half. Well, that's an exact value. So you should know that one of the solutions is going to be 60 degrees. And you're going to also do on your calculator 360 minus the 60, which is 300 degrees. Now, we want all of our solutions to be between th minus 360 and 360. So I don't think there's much point in adding 360 onto either of these ones that we're going to have here because it's going to go outside the range. But what I am going to do is I'm going to subtract 360. So 60 subtract 360 is minus 300 and 300 subtract 360 is minus 60. 
So we've got all of these solutions here. We're now just going to divide everything by two and we'll come up with the solutions for this. So the solutions are going to be minus 150, minus 30, 30 and 150 degrees. So I believe that this problem that I've got here really summarises loads of the stuff that you need to know for year two. And I also think you've got this problem in the first half as well. Sorry, for year two, for year one. So we're going to go on to the next part in a second and we're going to have a think about all of trigonometry in year two. I wanted to interrupt this video to tell you about a great website called Brilliant.org. If you haven't heard of Brilliant, it is this amazing interactive learning platform that has tons of courses on things from maths to computer science and science in general. Now, I think most people probably know about the courses section, but I wanted to show you about the practice section that they've got here. So if you go to the practice section and then if you go to geometry, because we're looking at trigonometry here, and in the trigonometry section at the bottom, you will see that there is a practice section where you can just get loads and loads of great problem solving questions. Let's have a look at doing some trig identities. So we could try it with some warm up questions like this one here. It wants us to prove which is equivalent from this list here to tan theta plus sec theta. And if it's not right, you've always got an opportunity to show an explanation that they've got here. The thing I really like about these concept quizzes is that they start off with quite simple ones and they build up to more challenging ones, going right down to these challenge quizzes that are at the bottom. If this is something that you think might interest you, go to the link in the description and there's an opportunity to get 20% off an annual subscription. This probably brings the price down to about two or three hours with a private tutor for a whole year of studying. Not only does it have stuff on trigonometry, but it'll cover everything in your A-levels and beyond, which would be great for things like UCAS statements and just exploring things that you're interested in. So have a look, see what you think of it, and I hope that you enjoy it. Okay, back to the video. Okay, so people are usually a bit surprised about this, but you can fit all of trigonometry year two onto just one page, and then I'm going to do a separate page, which is going to have some example problems. So we're going to start off with some of the stuff that's covered in chapter five, and we're going to go with radians. So what you need to know with radians, and the only thing you really need to remember here is that pi radians, which is just a different way of measuring angles, is equivalent to 180 degrees. That's just really the one that comes to my mind. Then 2 pi is obviously going to be double that amount because they have a proportional relationship. You can think about a half pi or pi over 2 is just going to be this one halved, which is going to be 90 degrees. And then when I see 2 pi over 3, I'm thinking of saying, OK, well, it's two thirds of 180 degrees, which is 120, because obviously a third is 60 degrees. Now, what you want to do over the course of year two is to think in radians rather than to constantly going back two degrees. That's easier said than done, but it's definitely something that I think you should um, work towards. So the small angle approximations, this is like a tiny bit, but it's worth um, having some of these things in this video because it still covers trigonometry. It's the small angle approximations only applies when obviously the angle is small, but also when the angle is being measured in radians. These pop up in the formula book, but it's worth remembering them. So sine theta is approximately just equal to its input, which is just theta. Cos theta is approximately equal to one minus theta squared over two or a half theta squared. And tan theta is also approximately equal to theta. So let's just quickly put that into practice with a really short question. It says, given that theta is small, find the approximate value of one minus cos theta over theta tan two theta. So I'm just going to zoom in on this so we can have a little closer look. So that would be one minus, now cos theta is going to be one minus theta squared over two, and that's all being divided by theta multiplied by tan two theta. Now tan two theta is just going to be approximately equal to two theta, it's whatever the input value is. So doing a little bit of simplifying in the numerator, you'll have the one minus one, which is going to cancel and you're going to have the minus minus theta squared over two. So that's theta squared over two, all divided by two theta squared. So you're going to have the theta squareds cancelling out, which is just going to leave you with a half divided by two, which is approximately therefore equal to a quarter. So it's basically just like some really silly um, extra substitutions that they've decided to add into the A-level. As we go across, they then have a little section in chapter five, which is about some shapes. And it's specifically to do with sectors, which is this area that you've got here, arcs, and then also segments. Now this last part, you don't necessarily need to memorize, but I think it's worth having. So the area of a sector is equal to a half R squared theta. And again, everything for theta here, it must be in radians. R is obviously just referring to the radius of the sector of the circle. 
the arc length, so the length of that pink line that I've got there is just going to be r theta, and the segment area, which is just this pink shaded part that you've got, um, you can think of about it like as the area of the sector minus the area of the triangle. So it's going to be a half r squared, and the area of the sector is theta, and it would be sine theta for the triangle. If I just quickly show where that comes from, the area of the whole sector is a half r squared theta, and the area using a half AB sine C is going to be a half AB sine C. So when you factorise that together, you end up with this. It can just be a nice thing to kind of speed up some of the questions. So let's just have a quick think about finding the area and perimeter of this shape that we've got here, this shaded shape down here. So this is 2.4 radians for this obtuse angle. So we're obviously going to need to know what this angle is on the other side. So to find out that angle, it's going to be... Let's call that theta. Theta is going to be 2 pi minus 2.4, because it's like 360 degrees minus 2.4. So I'm going to do my calculator, 2 pi minus 2.4. And in radians, that is going to be 3.883, 3.8831, etc., etc. So the area is just going to be equal to a half multiplied by the radius squared, multiplied by theta, which is 3.83, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to times that my calculator by a half, and then by 4 squared, which is 16. So the area is just going to be equal to 31.1 centimetres squared, and I've done that to three significant figures. So the perimeter of this shape is going to be the arc length that we have around the outside, which is just going to be the radius multiplied by theta, r theta. So that's just going to be equal to four multiplied by the 3.8831. But don't forget that you also need to add on this distance and this distance, which is a four and a four. So just calculating all of that together, we're gonna to have, let's just quickly do this. Times that by four and plus eight, and you end up with a perimeter being 23, 0.5 centimetres, and again, I've done that to three significant figures. Okay, so now we get onto the stuff that people actually really find difficult about year two. It's even more definitions to do with trigonometry. So they introduce these new things like sec, cosec, and cot. They sound like they're going to be quite scary, but they're actually not that bad. They're just relating it to other sines and coses. So sec theta, cosec theta, and cot theta all relate to either sine, cos, or tan. And the trick to do that is you look at the third letter. The third letter, the third letter, and the third letter. So sec theta is actually equal to 1 over cos theta, because the third letter is C. Cosec theta is equal to 1 over sine theta because the third letter is S, and cot goes to 1 over tan theta. I should say it's not because the third letter is S, it just happens to be that that's a nice way of remembering them. Equally, if you do the reciprocal of 1 over sec, you get cos theta, and if you do 1 over cosec, you get sine theta, and if you do 1 over cot, you get tan theta. So let's put some of that into practice by having a look at this simplified problem that we've got right here. So I'm going to leave anything that's in the denominator, sorry, in the numerator that's in its normal form, I'm just going to leave it the way that it is. So I'm going to still have the 3 up at the top, and I'm still going to have the 2. And this sec theta, let's deal with that one first of all. If it's in the numerator, I can now put it down in the denominator and I can change it to a cos theta. So that's me having dealt with that one. I'm going to leave the sine theta up top, and I'm going to leave the tan theta up top. So I've dealt with those ones. Now, why did I put cos squared down here? That was a bit silly. So that's going to be cos theta from earlier on. Now I'm going to deal with this cos, square, this cos theta, and now it's going to become a cos squared theta. Now the cot theta, which is in the denominator, like this one that we have over here, I can put it to the numerator and change it to a tan theta. So that becomes a tan squared theta. And the cosec theta, which is in the denominator, like this one, it can jump up to the numerator and become a sine theta. So it becomes a sine squared theta. So we've got now 3 over 2. I've got sine squared over cos squared, which is tan squared theta. And I've got another tan squared theta that's already in the numerator. So this just simplifies to 3 over 2 tan to the power of 4 theta. So sometimes people want to change this all to sine and cos. You can do, but I just think thinking about if it's in the numerator, you can move it to the denominator and put it to its, its um, related form. Or you could, if it's in the denominator, you can put it to the numerator and change it to its related form as well. 
Then we come across the Pythagorean identities now that we've learned about sec and cosec, etc. So if I take everything in this equation and then decide to, to divide it by cos squared theta to start off with, if I divide everything by cos squared theta, sine squared over cos squared is going to be tan squared. And I'm just going to write it here for the standard way that I do this. Cos squared theta divided by cos squared theta is just going to be 1. Don't worry about them switching places. It's just about it always looking in the right kind of way. And 1 divided by cos squared is just going to be sec squared theta. I also could have taken the original one and I could have divided everything by sine squared theta instead. Sine squared divided by sine squared is 1. Cos squared divided by sine squared, well, that's like sine over cos, but reciprocal. So that's going to actually be our cot squared theta. And 1 divided by sine squared is cosec squared theta. Now, these are called the Pythagorean identities, because remember, this one came from Pythagoras. Now we're going to have a look at the addition formulae. This is where you have two things inside the argument or inside the input of the sine and cos values, or tan as well, I should say. So for sine of a plus b, these do come in the formula book, but I think these are really easy to memorize. It's sine a cos b plus or minus cos a sine b. So for this one that we've got here, you have a different pairs of sine and cos for the trig values. So you've got like sine cos and then you've got cos sine, but you have got the same sine inside. So that means that when you have plus minus, you get plus minus. So the plus minus stays as a plus minus, but you have a mixture of sine and cos in these parts. Now cos is going to be different to this. You're going to have cos a, cos b, and instead of plus minus, you will have minus plus, which is going to then be sine a, sine b. So you'll notice here that this time they have the same trig. You get cos cos, then you get sine sine but this time they have the different sign that goes in it. So when it's a plus minus, it becomes a minus plus. All this means is that if you have a plus cos of a plus b, there'd be a minus here. If it was cos of a minus b, there'd be a plus here. Tan, probably useful to either just memorize it or look in the formula book, but it's just gonna be tan a plus or minus tan b all over one minus plus tan a tan b. Now, these addition formulae help you do the things called the harmonic identities, which is where you express something like this in either this form or this form. And I'm going to do an example on the second page for this, because I think that that's going to make it a little bit easier um, rather than trying to explain it. These are really good for doing maximum and minimum problems. And they're also good for solving equations that are in the form a sine theta plus b cos theta equals a constant. So last thing that we want to have a look at on this page is the double angle formulae. Now, the double angle formulae are basically variations of these formulae that you have here. So instead of it being a plus b, it just becomes theta plus theta. So if you imagine theta in all of these places, you would end up with the double angle formula for sine 2 theta. You would have two lots of sine theta cos theta. Now, cos of 2 theta, if you imagine this being theta plus theta, you would have cos a sorry, cos theta, cos theta minus sine theta, sine theta, which is just cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. So coming over here, you can use the Pythagorean identity to substitute in different things for sine or cos. You end up with two cos squared theta minus one or one minus two sine squared theta. Something to notice here is that for these two, they both start with the cos squared first. So cos squared theta comes first for these ones. And for tan 2 theta, you get uh, 2 tan theta over 1 minus tan squared theta. It's definitely worth memorising these ones. So let's put this into practice by having a look at this simplified problem that we've got here. Well, hopefully you can notice this looks a little bit like the 2 sine theta cos theta. So I'm going to rewrite this and I'm going to say that this is 4 multiplied by 2 sine x cos x. And it's also being multiplied by cos 2x. Now I can replace this section with the double angle formula. So it's going to be four multiplied by sine two x cos two x. Now I can split this four into a two times two. So it's gonna be a two times two sine two x cos two x. And this is also in this form here. So make sure you double this argument, this angle that you have, and you get two multiplied by sine of four x. So this thing here simplifies to two sine four x. What we're going to do now is we're going to finish off by trying to pull all of this together into these couple of example problems that I hope will summarise everything for trigonometry from year one and year two.
So we're going to start off by doing a harmonic identity question, which is this one over here. We're going to express 3 cos theta plus 4 sine theta in the form r sine theta plus alpha. And this time I'm just going to do my alpha. I'm going to do it in, uh, in degrees. Let's do alpha in degrees. And it's going to be between 0 and 90. So what you do for this is you just start off with r sine theta plus alpha. You expand it using the addition formula. So you get r sine theta cos alpha plus, switch them around now, r cos theta sine alpha. And we're going to compare this to the what we've got at the top. So that means that the r and the cos alpha is the thing that goes with the sine theta, which is 4. So I can write that down here, that r cos alpha equals 4. And if the next part, the r and the sine alpha is the thing that goes with cos theta. There's the cos theta here. So this means that r sine alpha is equal to 3. Now, to find out what alpha or what r is, to find out what um, alpha is, you're going to do this one divided by this one. Because the r's will cancel, you'll get a sine alpha, sine alpha over cos alpha, which is tan alpha. So you get tan alpha is equal to 3 over 4. And then if you just do the inverse tan of 3 over 4, you get 36.9 degrees. Now, to find out what r is equal to, it's really simple. You just do Pythagoras to these two values. So you get r is equal to 4 squared plus 3 squared, which is 5. Hence, 3 cos theta plus 4 sine theta is equal to r, which is 5, sine of theta plus 36.9 degrees. So that's what I mean by a... Um, harmonic identity. It then says, hence, find the minimum and maximum values of this expression that you've got here. So I said it was good for minimum and maximum values. Well, this looks like we can rewrite this because we've just worked out what 3 cos theta plus 4 sine theta is. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to say that it's 4 over 5 sine of theta plus 36.9 squared plus 1. Whoops, that needs an extra bracket in there. So we're going to try and find out what the maximum or what the minimum value is. So with a fraction, for a fraction, usually it is a maximum when the denominator is what? When the denominator, have a think, is as small as possible. So it's going to be a, a, a maximum when the denominator is as small as possible. So the smallest thing that this denominator can be is going to be when this part, the sine part, is actually going to be zero. You could try it with minus one, but then you're going to square it. And when you square a minus one, it's going to become a positive. So in this case, we want it to be when sine theta, when sine of theta plus 36.9 is equal to zero. So that we then get the maximum value is going to be four over zero squared plus one which is 4. For a minimum value, we want a large denominator. Try it with some numbers if you're not sure what I mean by that. So to make this as large as possible in the denominator, we want the sine theta to be as maximum as possible. So the maximum value that any sine function can take is going to be 1, which means the maximum value is going to be 4 over 5 multiplied by 1, all squared, plus 1. I've written maximum, I meant minimum. Which is going to be 4 over 25 plus 1, which is 26, or 2 over 13. That is the minimum value. Now, if you're thinking, oh, you normally do um, 1 and minus 1, if you put minus 1 as what you were trying to investigate, when you square the minus 1, you're just going to go straight back and you're going to come to this minimum value as well. So you just need to investigate. The best values to investigate are when sine theta is either equal to 0, when it's equal to 1, or when it's equal to minus 1. Okay, we're going to have a look at the last question, which I think will use lots of the ideas that we've got um, from the previous page. We're going to prove that cosec 2 theta minus cot 2 theta is always equal to tan 2 theta. So let's start off with the left-hand side that we've got here. The left-hand side is cosec 2 theta. Well, the third letter is S. Whoops. So that means it's going to be 1 over sine 2 theta. Now, the third letter is tan, so tan is normally sine over cos, so instead it's going to be cos 2 theta over sine 2 theta. Now, this can all combine together because they've got the same denominator, so it's going to be 1 minus cos 2 theta over 
sine 2 theta. Now you'll notice we're aiming for something that doesn't have 2 theta, so I'm going to want to use the double angle formula that we've got. And for the double angle formula that we have here, I'm going to replace the sine 2 theta with 2 sine theta cos theta. Now I've got a choice with the cos thetas. I've got these three to choose from. And I want to think which of these three I'm going to choose. Well, if I've got a 1 and I'm subtracting something, if I do 1 and I subtract something with a 1, those 1s should cancel. So I'm going to use this form. I'm going to do 1 subtract 1 minus 2 sine squared theta, which is going to give me 1 minus 1, they cancel. And I'm going to have the minus and the minus, so I get 2 sine squared theta over 2 sine theta cos theta. The twos are going to cancel, and that sine theta is going to cancel with the squared, so you get sine theta over cos theta, which is tan theta as they wanted. Last of all, it says hence, solve. This time they want us to solve it in radians, so we've got between minus pi and pi, we've got this thing. So we're going to see how the beginning part is related to part A of the question. Well, it looks like cosec 2y minus cot 2y can just be replaced with tan y. So the left-hand side is just going to be tan y all squared equals sec y plus 1. So we've got tan squared y equals sec y plus 1. Now, we can't solve this because we've got a mixture of tan and sec here, but we do know a particular Pythagorean identity, which is that 1 plus tan squared y is equal to sec squared y. That was one of them that we looked at over here. So I'm going to replace tan squared with sec squared y minus 1. So I get sec squared y minus 1 equals sec y plus 1. I'm going to put everything on one side because it looks like a quadratic. So I get sec squared y minus sec y minus 2 is equal to 0. So you can either factorise this or put it in the calculator. This is pretty easy to factorise though. You get that sec y minus 2 sec y plus 1 is equal to 0. So this either means that sec y is equal to 2, or it means that sec y is equal to minus 1. Well, sec y, third letter is c, we can just do the reciprocal to get cos y, and the reciprocal of 2 is a half. And for this one, we can do the reciprocal of minus 1 is just minus 1. So solving this equation that we've got here, and it wants it between minus pi and pi, when I do the inverse cos of a half, it's going to be 60 degrees, which I know is pi over 3 degrees, uh, pi over 3 radians. Um, and then the other one, you can do uh, pi, 2 pi, excuse me, 2 pi minus pi over 3. So you can do 2 minus pi over 3, which is 5 pi over 3. That one's outside the range, though, so you can subtract 2 from that and you get minus pi over 3. So when I subtract 2 pi from that one, I get minus pi over 3. So I've got this solution and this one. And then last of all, I'm going to do the inverse cos of minus 1, which is just going to be when y is equal to pi. So our solutions for this last question are minus pi over 3, pi over 3, and pi. You don't need to do minus pi because it is not included here. So that is everything for trigonometry across all of year 1 and year 2. Um, a pretty long video, but I hope that's going to help you with lots of the key ideas and that's going to help you with your revision. OK, so that was a lot of maths. If you feel like you need to go through any of these things in more detail, just go to my channel homepage, look up the chapter that you need some more help on, and you'll actually be able to kind of step into my classroom and see me really teaching a class. Um, and it will maybe help you with some of the things that are pretty difficult. There's some really hard stuff in here. People do find trigonometry one of the hardest bits. If you haven't checked out my Everything You Need to Memorise videos, do make sure you go and have a look at them. Like the video if you did like it. And if you would consider subscribing to the channel, that would also be great as well. Um, last of all, uh, just wishing you the best of luck for your studies. Let me know if there's any other topics you want me to do. Pop it down in the comments and we'll go from there. Thanks, guys. Good luck.